Bonjour et bienvenue à la deuxième journée du sommet de l'Association médicale canadienne sur la santé. Good morning and welcome to day two of the CMA Health Summit. How are you doing? Comment ça va? You're okay? You had a good night on the town? In the Byward Market, I'm sure? Anyone take a rickshaw run? A number of pounds ago, I used to run rickshaw. It doesn't look like, I actually used to be a rickshaw runner many, many years ago. Um, it's great to see you all. And, and I hope that you had a, a good sleep and that you were able to partake in the wonderful spread of the breakfast spread that we have uh, this morning. How many of you have had a chance to, to, to take a look at the streamers that are to my left at the back of the room? Just raise your hand, number of you, okay. Well, the wall of streamers, it's called a vision forest, and it's an interactive display. I'm realizing my phone is going off. So why, I was wondering, this strange background music, I was wondering why is it, why is it still on? Um, so it's called the vision forest, and it's an interactive display that has many of your responses to what healthcare should be printed on each streamer. So we encourage you to take a walk through it sometime today if you haven't had a chance to do so yet and read all the amazing answers. Um, it really pays to be friends with a doctor. Um, so I wanna thank my friend Ali Abdullah, who has, who's sitting right here, who has his, who has his cell phone on right now. Um, he has told me what the problem is that I have. Apparently I have a, a tear. What, what, what did you call it, Ali? What? A gastrointestinal tear? A gastrodemius tear. Gastrodemius. Nemius. Gastronemius. Okay, gastronemius. So, so I, ha I have a gastronemius or have a tear? I have both. Okay, so apparently that's what I have. So five to 12 weeks, you said? Recuperation? <laughs> Six or seven. You're not nice, you're not nice. Well, thank you. It's good to know, it's good to know what I have. Well, day one was, was of course, a fantastic start uh, to the summit. Uh, a di di we had dynamic and rich conversations about team-based care, uh, reducing admin burn burden, uh, ensuring physical, psychological, and cultural safety. And of course, uh, we ended with a session on combating misinformation. We have another jam-packed day ahead for you, including an appearance this afternoon from Canada's health minister, our new health minister, uh, the Honorable Mark Holland. And be sure to stick around for the closing session when climate change experts, Dr. Courtney Howard and the Honorable Catherine McKenna will lead a session on building a movement towards a net zero health system in Canada. But first, we're gonna kick off a very important discussion on a topic that's been getting a lot of media attention the balance of public and private health care in Canada. And I'd like to ask the CMA president, Dr. Kathleen Ross, to introduce this session. Kathleen. Thank you very much, Adrian. And I do want to tell you that we gave you that diagnosis yesterday. And I told you it would take a year per decade of your age so uh, <laughs> to get better. <laughs> Excellent. Th thank you and welcome uh, again here in Ottawa or virtually to this really important discussion. As we're having these critical discussions about what health care should be in the future, I think it's really important that we ground this in an understanding of what health care is now and how it works now. There's no surprise to anyone in this room that we are in a period of crisis. Lack of access to care, lack of access to primary care, emergency rooms closing, wait lists that are growing, even for life altering things they are going from months now up to years for such things as, as joint replacement. Those burner, burnout workers, or burned out workers that we have uh, are not being replaced fast enough and we're not doing enough to ensure safety, psychological, physical, and cultural safety in our workplace to retain people. We're in a state of crisis. Now, as a family physician who does uh, a lot of obstetrics, I must say that I feel this pain with 
delayed diagnosis and testing. There are not enough maternity providers in many places across Canada, and we see this when patients come in three, four months into their pregnancy, when it is often late in the game to get antenatal testing done, that can have lifelong consequences for their newborn. And when we send them off, the wait lists are crazy. We see this every day. Thursday, I sent a new to Canada, well, two years new to Canada patient home with a newborn with a complication and her only option for follow-up in the community was at an urgent and primary care center because despite trying multiple different routes, we'd been unable to attach her. So we start to have these conversations uh, about where are the gaps and where do we leave, but for, for us as providers, it's really heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking for me as a family physician, helping patients navigate a really complicated system and in some cases, not even able to make the needs met. I'll share a story of a young 28-year-old fellow, two children at home, his wife was, uh, was not working. He was the only income earner and he worked as a laborer. Worked all day, heavy job, but he injured his back and got an L5 disc at home, picking up one of his children. We did our best to expedite the care, knowing his social situation. The neurosurgeon actually told him, it's unfortunate you didn't do this at work because had you done it at work, we would have been able to expedite your surgery. We tried to get him in many different ways into care. Six months down the road, he'd lost his apartment, they'd moved in with family, and things were really becoming dire, even to get food onto the table. A family member who also worked at a minimum wage job took out a loan to pay privately for his surgery in Alberta so that he could get back to work. Fortunately, he had a good outcome and he did get back to work, but we hear these stories time and time again. So it is important that we have some discussions grounded in where do we go from here. We've heard some of the provinces are considering enhancing private care, uh, or privately delivered care, in order to deal with some of our access challenges. But that raises many more questions for us. Who should pay for care? What does that do to equity? What does that do to access? Is it going to fill some of the gaps? Should the private sector be filling some of our gaps? These are all questions that we need to have an open, honest discussion. And we need to hear from Canadians about what their wishes are and understand and try and look forward to the impacts this may have on our system. So you're here today at the launch of the first of a series of national discussions that will happen throughout the fall asking these questions. We want to hear from you, from providers, from patients, from those who provide the services, from insurance companies, from all players in this system. We need to understand what your viewpoints are and where are our blind spots. I think this is critically important as we have these discussions. But we also know that these discussions need to be grounded in a few really important tenets. We want healthcare in Canada to be accessible and equitable to all, regardless of your ability to pay. We want these services to be delivered in a workplace that is supportive for those that work there. These premises are critically important. So thank you for your engagement today. This input that you give us at the CMA will help to inform our recommendations for policy that will be shared with all of our stakeholders. But it's so important that we listen to all voices, that we do our best to bring all of these voices together so that we can share what Canadians want from their healthcare system, what we as physicians and providers want to aspire to provide, and how we can meld those two together. So thank you for being here today. I really look forward to these discussions both today and throughout the fall as we, uh, as we deliver these similar sessions in other cities. Much appreciated. And with that, uh, Adrian, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Before we introduce our speakers and hear their various perspectives, we thought it was important to have a shared understanding of what we mean when we talk about public and private health care in Canada. So we prepared this video. The English version will play in the room, 
If you wish to listen in French, you'll need to put on your headphones. And if you are online, you'll see the version based on the language you've selected for the conference. Canada has an aging population, more complex health needs than ever, and not enough health workers. Many patients aren't getting access to the care they need, and some governments are turning to the private sector for help. Do we need a new balance of public and private health care in Canada? The Canadian Medical Association believes it's time to talk. Regardless of their ability to pay, every Canadian is guaranteed access to hospital care, physicians, and diagnostic services like x-rays and blood tests. But every province and territory can determine how services are provided and what is or isn't covered by public health insurance. Private healthcare can refer to services that are not covered by any level of government. The physiotherapy you pay for through employee health insurance. Cosmetic surgery you cover out of pocket. Private healthcare can also refer to public health services delivered by private facilities or providers. For example, some governments outsource specialized procedures like cataract surgeries to private facilities. You can also get a flu shot at many for-profit pharmacies. Let's look at how access to an MRI scan varies across the country. Remember that diagnostic services are guaranteed for every Canadian, regardless of the ability to pay. But unless you need emergency care, there can be long, very long wait lists. In provinces including Alberta, Quebec and New Brunswick, paying a private clinic to get ahead of the line for an MRI scan is permitted. Full stop. In Saskatchewan, patients can pay for faster access to MRIs at private clinics. But clinics must match every privately funded MRI with a spot for someone on the public waiting list. Where paying for an MRI scan out of pocket is not an option at all, patients will have to travel to another part of Canada or another country. As of 2022, 72% of all public health care was paid for by governments, 15% by private health insurance, 11% by patients themselves, and 2% came from other sources, like donations. On average, Canadians spend more than $1,000 out of pocket on health care. In February 2023, the Angus Reid Institute surveyed Canadians on the possibility of increased private funding and delivery of care. 28% think privatization is a necessary evolution of care. 33% acknowledge the benefits of both public and private care. And 39% are public health care proponents. The CMA is listening to patients, physicians, and other health workers to hear their perspectives on the balance of public and private care in Canada. Join the conversation. Okay. Well, now please join me in welcoming the panel for today's discussion recognizing the blind spots in the public-private health care discussion. Eric Sandy is the president of Medivy Health Services, a health care delivery company that delivers out-of-hospital emergency medical services and home-based primary care 
across six Canadian provinces. Robin McGee is a registered clinical psychologist in Nova Scotia and a patient advocate. Her book, The Cancer Olympics, describes her fight for medical justice after a delayed diagnosis of colorectal cancer in 2010 and the discovery that the best practice chemotherapy was not available in her province. Dr. Hassan Sheikh is an emergency and addiction medicine <laughs> physician in Toronto and a board member with Canadian Doctors for Medicare. He's an advocate for better policies to address health inequities, including pharmacare, dental care, and the impact of precarious work on health. And a note to the audience, both in person and virtual, that we will be having a 20-minute Q&A with the panelists after our discussion. So at that time, you'll be able to ask or to post your questions. Welcome. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to you. Thank you. It's great, great to see you. And I'd like to begin, I'd like to ask each of you uh, this question. The current health system is not meeting the needs of most Canadians. How do we ensure patients have the access they deserve in a timely manner? And what will that mean for the balance of public and private care? And I'll ask Eric to start. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, good morning, bonjour à tous. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and be part of this really important dialogue. Um, we want to talk about access. We want to talk about improving health for Canadians. We want to talk about the fact that we saw yesterday that you know upwards of 80% of Canadians feel we need significant change in our health system to, to improve delivery for them. Um, before they do that though, I just want to give you a little context to the organization that I come from, just so you can see um, some of our, our perspectives. I, I work for an organization named Medivy. Um, Medivy um, has two main organizations within it. The first is Medivy Blue Cross. And Blue Cross, as I'm sure most of you know, many of you might be members, is a, a, a traditional employee benefits uh, organization, health insurance organization, providing dental, pharma, travel, life and disability insurance to about 10% um, about of Canadians. So that would be the 15% of Canadians that have private health insurance, um, or 15% of the, the uh, expenditure in Canada that you saw on the chart in the video. The organization I work for is called MediV Health, and we're a community clinical care um, delivery organization. We have about 6,000 clinicians across eight provinces in Canada. Uh, we run large uh, EMS ambulance systems for a number of provinces. Uh, we manage uh, clinical nurse care for a province. We uh, manage telehealth systems. Uh, we have a large uh, unattached patient clinic uh, that I'll talk about in a little while. Um, and we also have a training academy where we train about 400 paramedics, half of which work for the Department of National Defense every year. So as we've seen uh, in the data yesterday from, from Angus Reid and the discussions from, from learned colleagues over the last couple of days, Canadians feel healthcare has reached a point of crisis. And I think, of course, the catalyst for that has really been the pandemic, where people really acutely became aware of their health, became aware of uh, access and treatment. And it changed, I think, the debate in Canada from what it was even five years ago. I think that people have suddenly realized that the system could be doing better for themselves and their family. I mean, I even go to, um, uh, barbecues or dinners where people who aren't in the industry have read about the Commonwealth Fund study that now places Canada 10th out of 11th in terms of uh, the, the quality of our health care system uh, in the developed world. And of course, we're ahead of the US, but um, many would say that's not the highest bar to exceed. I mean, we are 10th in terms of equity, 10th um, in terms of outcomes, 9th in terms of access, and, and I could go on. So the average Canadian now understands that the healthcare system, which was always something we were exceedingly proud of and depended on, has changed in some way that requires a fix. And it's, for the average Canadian, it's mostly around access, and I would say it's in around primary care. We know 10 to 20% of Canadians, based on the study, do not have a GP in their community that they go to, and those with a GP often feel frustrated by the amount of time it takes to get there, and they want that to change. As a result, many of them are in our emergency departments, and we understand the congestion there. Certainly, as an organization running ambulance systems, you know we have a great deal of concern about the patients that are in offloads, where sometimes they 
can be in an ambulance for five or six hours at, a, at an ED. And we have equal concern, of course, for our dedicated colleagues uh, that are staffing those ambulances who uh, get burned out because they don't have control over their schedules, they're not practicing healthcare the way they were trained. So it's very, very difficult for them. So I think, though, that there is a way out of this and it's going to require a lot of collaboration. And from my perspective, I'm hoping that the private sector is invited to the table when we talk about how we can uh, come up with new solutions. And when we talk about private care, it's really important to understand there's really two distinct segments. The first is the private delivery of publicly funded health care. Now, that's what our organization does. We don't ever upcharge a patient for anything. We don't offer private services. And then there are private health care organizations that are for profit and um, are engaged in um, earning an income that way. Our organization is, again, it's a nonprofit organization. In fact, any profit we do generate, um, we pay a social dividend to a health foundation, which in turn invests in adolescent mental health, PTSD research, and uh, healthy communities. Um, so you might ask yourself, why would we want to engage with a private organization for, for a publicly funded organizations? Well, there are a few reasons that we've experienced and heard from the clients that we work for. And we work for the federal government, provinces, health authorities within those provinces, municipalities. The first one is we start the conversation with a shared set of values. Uh, and that, that allows us to really engage in a discussion from a place of, of, uh, of safety and respect um, because we're all, we all have the same objectives that our clients do. One of the main things that people look to us for is speed of execution. We have an ability, being slightly adjacent to the health system players, the large players, to be able to understand what the problem is, to block and tackle that, and we seem to have found an ability uh, to execute quickly, and I'll, I'll talk about an example of that in a moment. Uh, we're also very good at building capacity. Uh, we are good at building teams, understanding the scope of the clinicians we work for, understanding how to provide administrative support for them. And so we're, we're very good at integrating, we believe, uh, the clinicians that are required. So we can, we often, you know, we, we focus on getting the right clinician to the right patient, the right time, the right place, and right cost. Um, so that's another one of our, our better skills. Um, we're also very uh, um, accomplished, or not accomplished, people look to us for accountability. So in our contracts, uh, we often have value-based healthcare contracts, and in those contracts, we uh, assume extra risk that the health system sometimes uh, isn't prepared to take, and we're measured on a variety of metrics for performance. So for example, we could be uh, asked to reduce trips to the ED, um, speed up the care to someone in the home, make sure patient satisfaction is over 95%. And three quick examples. In PEI, we brought a 24-7 mental health crisis and mobile response team to the market within 90 days for that province. We've reduced ambulance trips by 75% and police uh, visits by 98%. It's been a very successful program. In Saskatchewan, we collaborated with the Saskatoon Tribal Council with Chief Arcan and with the province and the federal government to bring mobile clinics into seven First Nations communities where we're providing dental, mental health, and primary care for those communities. And the third one is around uh, a clinic we have in New Brunswick called New Brunswick Health Link, which is helping to manage all of the unattached patients there. If you are, uh, do not have a GP, you can sign up for the service. You have a problem, you give us a call. We have a nurse triage the call. If it's low acuity, we have a virtual channel for you to access. If not, we will arrange a face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with a GP and the goal is within five days in your community. It's longitudinal care. We have a health record for everybody involved in that. Um, so we can provide that continuity of care. We're up to about 50,000 patients now and we think we're gonna probably get upwards of 75 or 80,000 patients. And, uh, and what we're finding, which is kind of interesting probably for this team is this group is that uh, patients, there's a cohort that really likes that type of style of service, but we also see a lot of physicians that are quite interested in it because they can provide us with say four hours of care or even a uh, full time uh, five days uh, a week. Um, and they don't have to worry about the burden of administration or running a business. So it's a really interesting model. Ultimately, we want zero patients. They're all to be derostered back into the community when we can find room for them. 
uh, with a GP practice, but we probably aren't going to see that in the short or the midterm. Um, anyway, so those are three quick examples on how we've used speed of uh, execution, how we have taken on risk-based contracts, and how we have collaborated with stakeholders, um, most importantly with patients and family caregivers and with the uh, provider community. And with that, I think I'm just about, or I'm out of time, so we'll pass it on, uh, Adrian, to our next speaker. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Eric. You might just want to say your conflicts. You want to say your conflicts? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't state my conflicts. I didn't see them. It was on the slide. Um, so um, I assume you all saw that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Th thanks so much, Eric. Um, Robin, how about you? How do we ensure patients have timely access and what does that mean for the balance of public and private healthcare? Can I you can. Yeah, stand yeah. up and yeah. carry on? Here yeah. I've got a neuropathy in my feet, so I'm a little unbalanced. But um, so I'm here today uh, as a, uh, a patient partner, although as you've heard, I am a registered clinical psychologist in my day job. I'm actually chair of our regulatory college in Nova Scotia. And, um, uh, but I am also here today to, as a person who has uh, had stage four colorectal cancer for 13 years now. So uh, I, full disclosure, I am someone who in my role as a psychologist has delivered private services to people because mental health of course is not covered. Um, uh, and, uh, I, but I, and, and as a cancer patient, I am someone who has received private services but I also want to just go out and state my, my primary bias that despite that uh, history, I'm passionately committed to the public system, having devoted the past 30 years of my life to public mental health and public, um, uh, and public education. So um, starting from there, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about access around to things like cancer care, because cancer care, most Canadians assume once you get cancer, hey, you're way up there, you're, you're in the super lethal diseases, you are gonna not be in a private public uh, problem, you will have your, your, your therapies will be covered. Well, um, I just wanna kinda uh, elaborate on three things that I think have relevance to how we can improve, uh, uh, improve that. And the first thing um, I wanted to talk about is in this whole area of precision medicine. So formularies in each of the provinces fund cancer based on the body site of the original tumor. So breast cancer gets this, prostate this, ovarian gets that. And uh, however, science has evolved in cancer treatment. Anybody here in oncology, any oncology uh, folks here? Oh, this one. Yeah, science has evolved in such a way as that what, what medical oncologists want to treat the biomarker, the, the genetic mutation which drives the cancer, which can be the same uh, biomarker across many body parts. But unfortunately, the formulary isn't situated that way. So in my own case, for example, um, the, and this is where I talk about costs, biomarkers, most provinces will cover uh, two or three biomarker tests to evaluate where, where patients are at. If you really want to know what your biomarker status is, I had to pay $3,000 to a private company who did the genetic sequencing of my tumor and came back, hey, there is an actionable mutation in there. However, it's common in prostate cancer and ovarian cancer. You can't access the drugs for that because it's, we're, we're just not set up for funding that way. So that's one suggestion for that is we've got to relax the formularies to, uh, to dovetail better with the science on that one so patients don't end up in the position of having to pay huge dollars to find out how they can save their lives. And then, so that's one point. A second point I want to say is that very few Canadians know that east of Manitoba, oral cancer drugs are not covered at all. It's the patient's job, to, perhaps through, uh, through health insurance if they have it, but they, the patient's job is to acquire these medications and some of the costs that we're talking about are staggering costs, staggering. So the drug that I required, that I would require based on the precision medicine is, guess what? $17,000 a bottle in the United States, $8,000 a bottle in Canada. I had to outsource it to a, a pharmacy in Bangladesh. I could get it for $500 a bottle. But that's what we're putting patients through. How you must access, you want, to, you want this medication, you've got to, it's coming out of your pocket, by and large, unless there's some, 
The other path is through special compassionate programs. You could beg Big Pharma to give you compassionate uh, uh, dispensation of the drug. But I want to say in my own situation, when my oncologist said, really, you, what we want to go with, with you would be an immunotherapy. That would be the right thing now. But we, anybody here from Merck? <laughs> I, Merck, Merck, I, I begged Merck, uh, we did through, and then we refused to say, sorry, we, we're only gonna give it out for indications we like, not for the ones that you're talking about. So should I wanna pursue that as a, a Hail Mary to save my life? It's $10,000 an infusion. You need roughly nine infusions to kind of valid, to try it out. So that's $100,000. So let's just think about your average Canadian. Who can afford $100,000 right out of pocket? We, are, we have a system where only the wealthiest of us can access top-notch cancer care, and that's not right. So my final point, because I don't want to run out of time, my final part of, of the three is, uh, has to do with, when we talk about blind spots, what, is, what patients are figuratively and sometimes sort of literally blind to their own health records. And I like the idea of one patient, one record as a national thing for many, many reasons, but one of them being that if, we could, if patients can access their own data, they can better engage in their own health care. And uh, so that's uh, a, 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 an idea I'm sure will be discussed at some point in this meeting. And I really want to say this, that would be huge, huge, and, and I believe would res result in lower health care costs because patients can then take better care of themselves. And as a final point, I wanted to say, one of the questions that I was asked about in preparing for today was to say, how can we remove the emotion from the discussion, public, private? How do we make that conversation not emotional? And my reply as both a patient as a, and as a psychologist is to say, you can't, you can't take the emotion out of this. Why? Because, it, because the, our emotions are triggered by our deepest values, and our deepest values are engaged in that discussion. As Canadians, we're wondering, what kind of society do we want to live in, too? But it's also because it's about our lives. It's about our loved ones' lives, our children, our parents, ourselves. And you, you'll never have <laughs> a, a, a dispassionate conversation when, it, when you're touching on values that, that, that deep. So I'm going to leave it there. Uh, it's actually in my time limit. So um, and I'm happy to take questions later. Thank you. <laughs> Robin, you might want to state your conflicts as well. Oh, my conflicts. Yeah. I don't have any conflicts. <laughs> okay, okay. The last word uh, on this question is to you, Hassan. Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, and I think they'll put up my conflicts slide is that going to go up there we go so uh, for cma accreditation purposes those are my conflicts so as, as adrian mentioned i work in the emergency department and i feel like increasingly my job is just to bear witness to the failures of the healthcare system i see some nods in the audience every day i see people who are struggling with access to primary care or people who bring their mothers to the hospital, to the emergency department, because they're on a wait list for a hip replacement, and they're languishing and struggling for months and sometimes even years. And I understand in those moments that people are frustrated. The status quo is not working for people. And I understand in those moments when you're stressed about your health and the health of your loved ones, that people put the blinders on. They stop caring about the system and they care about whether they and their loved ones can access care. I think it's natural in those moments to wonder, if I can afford it, why can't I pay privately to access care quicker? But just like I also understand when a patient comes in requesting a full body MRI because they're concerned about a new strange symptom, the evidence doesn't support it. Right? And our job is to listen to our patients to understand the symptoms that they're coming in with, that they're worried about, but to create the right management plan based on the evidence. And the evidence for the symptom of poor access is very clear. Private pay is not going to help. There is a wealth of evidence out there, but I'll give you one quick example of what's happening right now in Quebec. Like everywhere in the country, we're facing a primary care crisis there. But some doctors are leaving the public system altogether and charging patients privately for access to primary care. 
And the results of that are extremely predictable. You cherry pick the healthiest and the wealthiest out of the public system, you treat them privately. And because we have a finite resource in the number of primary care doctors, our public system now has less resources and you're seeing more complex patients with less resources to actually address their issues. And now you're looking at your colleagues who have left for the private system who are making more money for less difficult work. And as people burn out, and we're seeing people burnt out all across the province, the results are again predictable. People are leaving the public system and that cycle just worsens and continues. In the last decade, double the number of family doctors have left the public system in Quebec to work in the private one. And that cycle is only going to perpetuate and continue. So with the wealth of evidence out there, why are we continuing to have this discussion about privatization? I sometimes joke it feels like a national pastime for us. Right? Every few years, this, this discussion rumbles up. And I think part of it is that we compare ourselves to some of our peer countries. Places like the UK, Sweden, France, Germany. Places that have a small, highly regulated, parallel private system. And we think maybe that's what we need. But where we compare to those countries is not on a lack of private health care. It's that we have too much private health care compared to those systems. 30% of our system is privately funded already. And those peer countries we compare ourselves to, they sit around 15%. They cover more things than we do, a much more rational basket of services like dental care, pharma care, home care. But for some reason, we latch on to this idea that it's that small parallel private system that's the difference, when it really, really isn't. One of the major differences between high functioning healthcare systems and what we do is that they don't just fund care, they actually coordinate it and deliver it, right? Dr. Uh, Dr. Smart talked about this yesterday, where our governments have to take ownership of the care that we're actually delivering. Right now, I could go down to Bay Street in Toronto and set up another walk-in clinic. And through fee-for-service billing, the Ontario government will pay for that care. But that's not where the need is right now. But if we took our system seriously and we match the resources we're willing to provide with the actual needs of the communities we're trying to serve, well, then we can realize visions like the one that Dr. Tara Kieran talked about yesterday, where every Canadian has access to a primary care team, just like we guarantee access to public education for every child. Those are the types of modern solutions we need to this issue of access, instead of rehashing old debates about privatization and private pay. Just imagine instead of, as a family doctor, being expected to know every single surgeon in your area and their individual wait lists, you could refer to a centralized referral pathway. And your patient could see the next available specialist in the region that they're able to travel to. Those are the types of solutions that are gonna help that mother that I see in the emergency department get the hip replacement they need in a timely way. Those are the types of solutions that are gonna help access in a way that's equitable and the most efficient use of our resources. Now, I see failures of our healthcare system every day in the emergency department, and sure, I see failures of our public healthcare system. But very often, I see failures of our private healthcare system. I see people come in with bad facial infections because they couldn't see a dentist for a simple toothache. And I see people with bad diabetic ketoacidosis who end up in the ICU to great risk to themselves and great expense to the system because they couldn't fill a simple insulin prescription. So as the CMA embarks on these discussions, I hope we can leave some of these, these old outdated myths behind around private pay. In fact, I think we should be talking about publicizing our healthcare system. And I think we should be talking about how we better coordinate and deliver care, whether that's publicly delivered care or privately delivered care that's on a not-for-profit basis, like we heard about from Eric, and what role, if any, does privately, for-profitly delivered care play? 
Those are the types of modern discussions we need to have as the CMA embarks on a present day conversation about how we improve access to uh, care in our system. And I think we can leave behind these old myths like private pay. Thanks. Thank you, Hassan. Um, Eric, perhaps I'm, I'm going to begin with you because Hassan just alluded to the fact that this private public uh, debate is an old one. Um, but it seems more urgent now. And, 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 and I'm, I'm curious as to why it seems as if there's more talk about shifting the balance at this moment. Why? Well, I think you, you only have to look at the headlines that were in the video. We've all read them, and uh, we've all probably been behind the scenes of, of some of those stories. Uh, I, th I think Canadians are, are just fearful that they can't get care in a timely fashion. I mean, you look at the, the waits at uh, emergency departments. You look at the number of uh, rural hospitals that are closing their EDs. You see ambulances that aren't meeting response times because they're stuck in, in a congested acute system that, that can't quite get ALC patients into long-term care and can't free up beds. So they, they're, they're afraid of that for themselves and their family. You also have an aging population, lots of boomers in this room. Um, you know, that, that as we hit 65 and further, it's gonna, our health's gonna be more difficult, more complex, more expensive. So people are quite uh, concerned about that. So, uh, you know, I think this really came to the forefront, I think, as I mentioned earlier during the pandemic, when, when multitudes had personal experiences with this. And now we see, you know, in Nova Scotia, where Robin lives and I lived till recently, that was an election that was won based on healthcare. Um, careful what you wish for, uh, but uh, um, I think that uh, patients are starting to become uh, citizen voters. And I think that's uh, getting the attention of uh, not just the policymakers, but of politicians. And, you know, it's, it's uh, f top of the agenda at this moment. Robin, why is this issue at the top of the agenda right now? Why, why, why are we having this particular I, I think I'll go back to what you'd said earlier about COVID. I think COVID, really, every citizen of the world who's paying any attention at all, focused that, yeah, hey, my, my life could be endangered at, at any point. And so I think Canadians had a new attention to their, to their health. And I think that's causing some, uh, there was, as you know, there was much anxiety over COVID around, um, um, colonoscopies and other things being delayed, eye care, other things. And I think that uh, people were anxious then and they continue to be anxious now. Mm -hmm. Hassan, you said there's way too much private health care in this country, 30%. Um, would you describe yourself as an abolitionist? <laughs> uh, I would describe myself as a scientist. I think it's just following the evidence of what's out there. And, and that's where my, uh, you know, my remarks are stem is, from. Is there any room in the system, in your world, is there any room in the system for private health care? I think... And uh, if, if so, what? And in particular, you're talking about private pay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to say there's no role in it. Uh, you know, we have a lot of private pay now, and I think the question is, is moving in the other direction going to help our system? I don't think the evidence supports that. I think moving us into a situation where we have more public coverage for essential health care uh, based on the evidence, I think that's the way forward. Mm -hmm. What are the myths that, that surround public health care? What are the myths that need to be debunked? I think the biggest myth that needs to be debunked is the idea that public health care is inefficient. I think that, you know, as uh, Dr. Alika Lafontaine uh, mentioned yesterday, when we pool our risk you know, we pool our risk pool together, that's going to be the most efficient system. I think the issue is in the execution. And I think the status quo is not working for people, and rightfully so, they're fed up. But it's very hard in a large public system to know who's to blame, who's in charge, who's coordinating the system. But it's entirely doable. And I think when I look at uh, you know, some of the, the stressors that I have in my job, the idea of then also having to navigate with insurance companies and paying out of pocket and, and all these other administrative burdens, like that's not going to make our system more efficient. It's going to make it less efficient. We already have care that is far too fractured, far too siloed, and introducing multiple payers and having to navigate all of that, 
I mean, I, I dread that idea. Eric, do you concur with what Hassan said? Yeah, I think the, the big myth is that we actually have a system. You know, we, we do have 13 different systems. Um, you know, I'm able to, I, I work in eight different provinces, so I can see, you know, the problems are more or less the same across the country. Each system has its own picadellos and neuroses, but more or less they're trying to tackle the same things. But it's very difficult to move best practices from province to province and, and to get the kind of scale that we often need. I'm also privileged to be on the board of Healthcare Excellence Canada, and that's our mandate essentially, is to spread and scale innovation in healthcare across the country. And it's very frustrating, not just are the provinces siloed, but within each province, the silos Hassan talks about are, are evident there too. And if we could just reorganize so we could build capacity by having people work on a team-based approach, a lot of these problems would start to fall away. And I think the, the heat would come out of the debate. Because I think there is room for private providers, assuming we hit a very acceptable benchmark that's equitable for all Canadians. I think if we can deliver that baseline and everybody's satisfied, then maybe there's room to have a discussion about can, you know, how can a private organization help someone with a very specific problem. Um, but I, you know, I think the big myth is that we actually have a system. Robin, is there room in the healthcare system that you imagine for, for private providers? Um, I would say that there might, there is a role. And uh, as well, I said- What is it? Uh, what, well, what do you think I, it should be? I think it, some things are, <laughs> see, this is the issue, is that when you, what you experience in your own life, my own life, is the opposite of what my overall values are. So my overall values is that diagnostic imaging is a right of every Canadian. However, um, I've had experiences with, with, with delays and my own anxiety about my well-being that I went and paid for private imaging uh, for that reason. So that, so in, but that's not, that shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that uh, the wealthy, as I consider myself privileged, to, uh, can access that and, uh, and, and uh, other Canadians can't. I just want, one last point I want to make about what we talk about foundationally here, about what can be different uh, as a scaffold to build us forward on this discussion. Canada is 10 out of 11 in that list. In part, we are one of the only uh, countries have socialized medicine that does not have nationalized pharmacare. If we could nationalize pharmacare, the woman would have had. Thank you. That woman, the in, woman in, in, uh, he's in, in diabetic could have had her, her prescription filled easily and wouldn't have ended up in dire straits and her family would be spared that suffering as, as, as would she and the system would have not paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for her ICU care. So that, that's a fundamental point I want to make. We need to have those systems in place before we can build further uh, on this on this issue because that is, pharmacare is one of the biggest obstacles for, for patients to access uh, health. Mm -hmm. I said, Robin mentioned earlier that, that, that this debate is so fundamental that it speaks to our values. Mm -hmm. uh, and so as a result, you cannot remove the emotion right. from this kind of discussion. What then is the way forward in this debate? What, what, what should be the next step? I mean, I think the, the first step is that values discussion about what do we care about. You know, every healthcare system in the world has to ration care somehow. You know, a lot of countries ration that care based on ability to pay. And I think the question is, what do we care about? I think we want to ration that care based on need, based on the evidence of what works and what doesn't. And if there's medical interventions that are essential to people to live a healthy life, then I think those should be the ones that we cover as a, as a community. Mm -hmm. And so I think that values discussion is really the first step. And then the second step is what does the evidence show? And we follow that. How, how much is this is about money? I don't think it's about money. I think that when you look at how much we spend, you know, compared to our peers, it's all roughly about the same. Like definitely there's a, an investment issue we have in terms of the fact that we don't cover major essential healthcare pieces. But I don't think it's about money. I think it's about taking ownership of our system and saying, we're going to make commitments about how people access care. We're gonna coordinate that care and we're gonna measure it 
and we're going to be held accountable to that. I'll give you a quick example of, of, of how it's not about money, and in fact, this, if we do this right, we can save money. Uh, I had a, a remarkably rare, quiet emergency department shift, at least the start of my shift on Wednesday. And uh, me and one other physician, emergency physician, were sitting around waiting for patients to be brought into rooms. And we actually had rooms for them to be brought into, which again is remarkable, never happens. Patients were triaged, patients were registered, and they were waiting an hour and a half in the waiting room because there was no one to bring them in and put them into rooms. <laughs> right? That's not an efficient use of resources. Uh, we could have stopped paying, I mean, my colleague, maybe not me, and use that money <laughs> To, to pay for a porter and another nurse, and we could have really expedited people's care. People could have got care faster, cheaper, and better. But it, it requires someone to be actually looking at the system and saying, okay, this is my job. My job is to coordinate the system, to manage it, and to use our resources efficiently and responsibly. Robin, is there a lack of capital? Is, is the lack of capital a problem? The lack of money, is this a money issue to you? Are you referring to, pay, to patients? I, I, yes. <laughs> yes, we have, uh, uh, as we know, uh, Canadian, uh, there's a lot of research on the social determinants of health. And uh, I certainly in my many, my decades, my three decades as a psychologist saw many, many people who's, uh, who's, uh, who don't have income security. They don't. And, they do, because, and because they don't, they can't access health care. So, uh, so uh, the, 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 there's so many studies now on how poverty begets poverty, increases poverty, and uh, as we've, we've all heard about other issues around sort of uh, affordable housing and things like that, that the more we make healthcare out of reach of a poorer people, they will die and they will suffer, and that's, that's not our values in I, Canada. I, I guess I wanted to get at, though, if there is enough money within the public system. Has, has enough money been invested in it? Is this a money problem? I, I think the money can be invested uh, with along the lines of creative solutions like we're hearing about. <laughs> Hiring someone to bring people into the ER is, would not cost very much, but it would have saved a lot of money. Same, same thing that uh, if, I, I think that our money, our public money can be more rationally spent if we invest in some of this scaffolding and preventative things, as well as, uh, as um, 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 engage patients in their own care uh, and the more we do that I, I believe the more you hear the patient voice around these things you'll be hearing that money is an issue for most Canadians. Eric you're chomping at the bit. Yeah I, I think there there is enough money in the system I mean if you look at the international um, leaderboard if you could call it that you know we, we do have a, a pretty fulsome uh, percentage of our GDP that's dedicated to healthcare, where it's spent, of course, is is the debate. So, you know, I would advocate for large shifts of that funding, for example, to go into community-based care. Um, you know, I think um, we've been in very much an acute-based system. I think the evidence shows that people want, when appropriate, the healthcare delivered in in their community, preferably in their homes. And there's evidence to show we can get better outcomes that way. So I'd like to see a significant shift into the community itself. And that, that's uh, through GP practices, right through to, to nurses, to think of our poor PSWs out there that barely make a living wage, that do so much for, for individuals and their families, and uh, you know, really are the canary in the coal mine. They see those patients more than anybody. And you know, how can we employ them better so we can understand when people are decompensating and what the issues are? So. For me, it's about rejigging the budget uh, in significant ways. And it's been done before. I mean, I, there's a case in, in Denmark, I'll get it wrong, but they just decided to move significant amounts of money from the acute system to the community over a sensible period of time. And their outcomes have been um, stellar as a result. Hassan, I think you've alluded to some, but what aren't we talking about uh, that needs to be addressed when it comes to public, private care? And why is this topic so uncomfortable? I think, uh, I mean, the stakes are high. I think people are fed up. So I think that's why, uh, why this topic is continue, continually brought up. And I think it, it's part of our identity, which is why I think it's hard to let go uh, in some cases of, of, uh, of the, the idea of, of public health care. But I think that's exactly why we need to keep defending it and keep securing it. 
because it is a value that we hold dear. I think in terms of what we're not talking about is I think we're not talking enough about, uh, as I said, publicizing the healthcare system uh, in terms of the things that we need that aren't in the basket of services currently. And I think the other thing we're not talking about is, is not on the financing side, but on the delivery side. What is the mix and what's the uh, best way for us to figure out how we deliver care? That might be in a public setting like a community health center. It might be in a not-for-profit center like some you know, high volume surgical centers that are attached to, to public hospitals or you know, a for-profit uh, private delivery model like a family doctor's office. And I think the other thing we're not talking about is the creeping increase of you know, investor-owned for-profit corporations that are taking over the delivery of care using public dollars to both deliver care but also to pay out uh, to shareholders and whether that's the way we want to spend our limited resources and the money that we have in the system. Mm -hmm. Robin, what, what are some things that we're not talking about that we need to be talking about? I, you know, as, 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 as I'm listening, I'm thinking about uh, cancer care uh, uh, as uh, where I'm coming from, that the, um, the whole, um, there's even, I was saying, it was, there was a research paper published recently that was looking at what is, what's the wealth structure of the people who participate in clinical trials. And the results indicated that only the very wealthiest Canadians were taking access, were, could have had access to clinical trials, had the time and the money, the ability, et cetera, the childcare, everything else, to go and participate in clinical trials. With the result, this paper concluded that we can't generalize the results of these clinical trials any longer to ordinary Canadians because diet is different and health is different and education is different and all these other factors, which as we know, influence health. So I, w one of the things we're not talking about is how a, we are actually compromising our science, our medical science, our research into various conditions is, is, uh, is it not acknowledging the wealth uh, uh, and poverty debate uh, around access to science. So we are actually misleading ourselves by staying by saying, let's have it. Let's have how, let's let's have people pay out of pocket for eternity to cover these unmet needs. The only thing I would add to the list is uh, I don't think we talk enough about equity in the system. And uh, you know, if you look at the shameful outcomes in many First Nations communities, racialized urban communities, uh, rural Canada. Uh, I don't think we talk enough about you know, how we're supporting those communities. And I think there is a role here for a, a lot of um, public funding of private delivery uh, in terms of bringing technology, possibly as a solution for those who are able to avail themselves of that technology, or even to fill gaps. Um, you know, the, we, we, for example, send crews up to the north quite often, uh, nurses and paramedics to assist uh, where we see gaps uh, when there are emergencies that you know the, the system can't fill, um, you know, we can quickly deploy to assist with that. Um, and there are many, many other organizations that can do that too. So I think we really need to surface that equity discussion and, and make sure that we're, uh, they don't, doesn't get lost in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. I have one more question uh, before I open it up to, to, to the floor. How do we work together to improve access to care? Um, it's something that, you know, obviously everyone wants to achieve. So, Hassan, let, let, let me begin with you. I mean, I think the first step is to make that commitment that we're going to improve access to care. I think we have to measure access to care. We have to report on it. We have to talk about it publicly, about where we're falling short, and, and make sure that we continually are trying to, uh, to make it better. And I think unless we're measuring and publishing and being transparent about how we're doing, I don't think we can figure out, you know, whether what we're doing is working or not. Robin? I like some of the ideas that were expressed yesterday. The idea of a team-based care, the idea of a catchment area. So as I said, I worked in public health, mental health and public education. When I went over to public education, you, in mental health, you would see the people who were able to get to the door of the mental health clinic in public schools, you got everyone. You got the essentially the entire, everybody in the public goes to public school, more or less, a few exceptions. So the catchment-based model, I think, really can work well for 
uh, delivering services to a catchment. You think about a show like Call the Midwife, where the, the, uh, the midwives are responsible for that area of London, and that's what we see. We see good people working for the poor in that show, and I'm, what I'm, I think that model, the catchment area model, could really, really enhance access. Eric? Yeah, the only thing I'd add is uh, I think we need a collaborative but agile model. We can't end up in you know endless, endless discussions. We need to come to some solutions. But I, I think first and foremost, we have to bring patients and family caregivers to the table. It, you know, to have a patient advisor is only baby steps. We need collaboration with patients and, and family caregivers because I think what they're going to do is they're going to more or less say, please, we need pragmatic solutions and we need them quickly. And I think that, you know, when you start and end the discussion with the patient and their needs, you're going to probably cut through a lot of the, uh, the bluster in the discussion and, and come up with good pragmatic solutions that, that could employ, you know, all the stakeholders at the table. Mm -hmm. let, let's go to the audience now. Um, if there's anyone who has a, a question. So is there a microphone there? Please, please go ahead with the first question. Right, right, right there, okay. Just hard to see. Okay. Hello there. Thank you. I get, I get so many thoughts in my head and I'm gonna to try to keep it focused within about uh, 45 to 60 seconds. We have so many ideas. We have so many people with passion. We have so many people with lived experience. We have quintuple aim. We have thoughtful uh, leaders working together to solve a problem. But remember, we're talking about the blind spots in private and public health care discussion. And the biggest blind spot, in my opinion, is that we're not just health care. We're everything. We're clean water. We're homelessness. We're mental health. We're people that are not appropriately educated to look after themselves. So healthcare literacy and education from junior kindergarten to the end of grade 12, as not one course in grade 10 about health and STIs and alcohol addiction will determine the outcomes of everyone. And also that instead of paying for a system that's based on sick care, a 70 year old system, that's based on dealing with people at the end of their lives, at the times when they're in the worst scenario, while we wait until they're disabled and then we deal with their hip replacement after they've lost years of work. Let's talk about primary health care. Eric talked about this. In fact, all of you talked about it in some way. Everyone needs a family doctor. Everyone must be connected to a nurse practitioner in a community. And that, I'm hoping, is the discussion that we're gonna talk about, that we invest our money in primary care, mm -hmm. the stitch in time to save nine. Thank you. Does anyone have a response to that? Yeah, yeah I'm happy to. I, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. You know, when you look at the data from around the world and you look at uh, reviews of the OECD and what makes a, a health system function uh, efficiently and high quality at the best price, the factors that come out of it are exactly the type of things you brought up. It's which country invests in addressing the social determinants of health, which countries invest in primary care, but on that list nowhere is you know the, the privatization of care. That doesn't you know, bear out as one of the factors. So I think we absolutely need to look beyond the healthcare system as it's traditionally defined and really, uh, you know, invest in those social determinants if we want to actually improve health outcomes. Robin or Eric, did you want to add? I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. One of the things that <clears throat> we always notice uh, is the lack of social development uh, being at the table. Um, so many provinces have a Ministry of Social Development and a Ministry of Healthcare. Why they aren't the same kind of befuddles me because uh, they absolutely have to be there. And if I have one lesson from the states I learned, I used to work down there a little bit and worked for an accountable care organization managing discharges uh, for people with uh, Medicare and Medicaid. The task was not just to set them up for success uh, medically to make sure that they were comfortable and they had their, their meds, etc. Did they have a, a decent home to, to live in? Was there food in the fridge? Did they have an air conditioner? In some cases, did they have cable TV, you know, so that they could have, you know, participate in society? So, you know, there are so many things that drive good health that are outside of what we normally think of. And I think that, you know, it's essential that that be part of the conversation. Okay, we're gonna go to the next question in the audience. Hi, everyone. Hi. 
everyone. Thank you so much for your wonderful remarks. I'm Mel Bechard. I'm a pediatric emergency doc here in Ottawa and a yoga instructor for those who were here <laughs> yesterday. Um, it strikes me that amongst all the panelists, nobody was suggesting that patients should pay more for their health. But based on the introductory video that we saw and the introductory remarks, it seems that the CMA is planning to look into this question of private financing of healthcare with their upcoming national summit. And from what we've heard, it doesn't seem as though anyone thinks that will help. It's not in line with evidence. Folks can accuse me of being ideological, but as Timothy Caulfield said yesterday, facts are facts. It's a zero-sum game at the end of the day. If I am paying to be seen faster, that means somebody who can't afford it will be seen more slowly. So it seems as though if we're in agreement that having patients pay for health care is not going to help our wait times, it's not going to help our various problems with the status quo, which we absolutely should fix, I'm curious for each of you, what would your advice be for the CMA as they embark on these national consultations? What are some better questions that we could be asking patients and physicians? Robin, do you want to take that question? Want to start? I'm pondering the point about the better questions. What better questions can we be asking? And I think that ties in with something that you had just said a little earlier, is that uh, one of the things I'd like to see on your way forward is that you do engage patients at all levels of your decision making. Not only when we talk about patient engagement, we're not just talking about patients engaged with their own care. We're talking about patients engaged with the system, patients who want to uh, uh, improve uh, uh, health care and, and participate in health care reform. There are many, many, many of us out there. Um, I belong to a group called uh, Patients for Patient Safety Canada. So we're a vetted group of harmed patients, people who have been harmed by sort of medical wrongdoing. We won't get into that, but that's a whole other conference. But <laughs> but uh, to uh, uh, those are those are people who have answers to things that uh, and lived experience that would be really valuable to this kind of discussion. So I'm just asking all decision makers to be um, alert to the possibility of engaging patients and as many as you can. Not just one. I've been on working groups where there was one patient representative. That's just tokenism. You have to have uh, at least two on any working group and that, and you got to take it from there. So I think if you listen to patients' voices, You'll, you will come up with qu uh, questions to address that are important to them. Mm -hmm. Eric, you look like you wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I don't think I would change the question. Um, I just think that there, there are subtleties within that exact question. And I think we immediately jump to wealthy, privileged individuals jumping the queue to get private, uh, pay privately for private health care. I think before we get there, that, that demand's always going to be there. I'm going to guess society in Canada, ultimately, we will get to some level of that, but not yet. And there's a lot of room for the private sector to help us get the system to a point where we feel that it's kicking on all cylinders. You know, the private sector can invest capital in a publicly funded system to assist where governments may have a difficulty or they may take on risks that government aren't prepared to take on. You know, they may be able to offer programs in the public realm where they can get the execution to happen more quickly, uh, you know, where they can be more accountable through contracts. So I think there's a lot of room for the private sector to assist with the uh, publicly funded delivery. And then I think ultimately we will get to that debate, but I don't want to have that till the system is at a place where we feel it's stable and is equitable and we've slayed you know, a number of these dragons. Do you have something to add, Hassan? Yeah, I, th I think I would say there's, uh, there's kind of two main questions I would ask. I think the first question is what's private that we need to change? You know, what's privately funded that we need to start to include in our publicly funded basket of services? Um, and then the second is how are we going to use those public dollars and work with the private delivery models in a way that informs the system going forward? So what kind of data do we need to collect? How can we use it to, to fund innovation and nimbleness and to try new things? But how can we take that, those learnings and actually apply them across the system uh, that is publicly delivered or delivered on a not-for-profit basis so that we don't just have you know, what Canada is famous for, which is amazing pilot projects all over the country that never go anywhere, right? But that's where we can work together with the private delivery part of this and actually build a system that works for every Canadian. Okay. 
We have a question here from Zaina Kayat, and the question, it's kind of a question comment. The way private care defined in the video, so, sorry, the way private care is defined in the video is the reason we have a debate that does not move forward. We can't interchangeably use private care as an umbrella term for both publicly insured, privately delivered services, privately paid and delivered services, two completely different ways for people to access care. Which balance does CMA seek to discuss? Hassan, do you have a response to that? I think that's a great question. I mean, that's my question too. Uh, I think that I've always tried when I, when I speak to make the distinction between financing and delivery. Uh, and I think it's, it's really the most important part of this is that we define that clearly uh, before we have the discussion. Personally, I think the, the privatization of funding discussion is kind of old and outdated uh, and not really pushing us forward. But I think the discussion around private delivery and how we integrate that into the system is one that we can certainly have uh, in a productive way for the system. Yeah. Here's another question from Rene Boudreau. How can we better deal with the acceleration of care fragmentation driven by, driven by the introduction of an increasing range of new models and players, both public and private? It feels like funding and energy and HR is flowing to the, quote, easy to fix areas, leaving the big hairy issues with our public system lingering, a self-realizing prophecy. Robin? Um, uh, <laughs> so the question is, the question is, what? Your response. What, what do you what do you think about what he said? What do you think about the comment? Do you do you agree with the comment? Is it something that you? Just one out of, uh, responding in, in some sense out of the lived experience aspect of this is that when we start to rely on payers that are private insurance, people are turned down by private insurance, and those profit motivated companies, uh, not better be they're they're great, but 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 those companies are in this in, in the business of making money for themselves, so they do turn down patients. So people are left with no option, but, but, but out of pocket pay, or they don't, and their health suffers, sometimes uh, fatally. And uh, so I guess, uh, I guess that's a part of this conversation that's not happening. What about the profit motive of the private system that's doing this public engagement? How do we make sure that people aren't scalped? How do we make sure the patients really do get services they're insured for? Because saying someone has private insurance, that's not going to help you when it comes to oncology. So I'm going to ask one more question here and then go back to the audience. This is from Greg Manning. The 2021 Commonwealth Fund report highlighted the poor performance of the U.S. system compared to other Western countries. In Canada, we consider private health care to equate with the U.S. system, but fail to compare ourselves from other high-performing countries with private systems like Australia and the U.K. What can Canada learn from these other systems? Eric. So one of the things I find interesting that we don't really talk about that these high performing countries have, whether it's Holland or France or Denmark or perhaps Australia, is they actually have competition with, with uh, publicly funded health plans, um, which I find really interesting. You have a choice in those countries, not just with the, the publicly funded Medicare system like we have here that we support through our taxes, but through taxes in those countries, there may be two or three different organizations, nonprofits, publicly funded, but they may have different uh, track records, they may compete with each other, they may have different perspectives. And I find that we don't really talk about that. I, you know, maybe that's, you know, uh, a bridge too far in this country and, you know, trying to imagine marshalling us to, to sort of change how Medicare delivers in this country might be too, too much uh, to even contemplate. But it is interesting how the competition in those plans seem to provide better patient experience and better health outcomes. Okay. Let's go back to the audience. Yes, at the back. Hi. Yeah, my name is uh, Atlas. I'm with the Patient Voice. Um, so. I don't have a question as much as just a couple uh, points that I really don't want to get forgotten in this conversation. Um, so I'm just going to disclose that I am on ODSP, which is the Ontario Disability Support Program. And I just want to remind everyone uh, that throughout the pandemic, um, I could not work because I am uh, immunocompromised. So um, I just want to let everyone know that my income on this support program um, and what every other disabled person made 
um, who had to rely on this was $14,820. That is their entire earning for the entire year. Um, I live in Ottawa, where the average rent right now is $1,500 for one bedroom. That comes to $18,000 a year. So the uh, math is yeah. not... I don't like the math, um, if I'm honest, so I want, I will never forget that number because I had to survive off that with my two dogs. Um, so that's one perspective I don't want to get forgotten in this. Um, also, I am on about nine prescription medications right now, so the cost of my care is pretty significant. The one medication that I'm on, one injection, is over $1,000 for the cost of one drug alone. So if I were to need to pay for even a portion of this on my own, I cannot afford that. I cannot afford to live. I cannot afford to survive. Um, lastly, the point that I wanted to bring up was last uh, meeting yesterday, we had talks about uh, safety, the cultural, psychological, and physical safety. Um, and a lot of patients are not feeling that in the system the way that it is. We discussed um, how much white supremacy is still active in this system and how many patients uh, can't access care and also choose not to access care because they are afraid and don't have that safety in the system. And I just wanted to share that if we have to start paying or we are afraid that we may have to pay in the future, I think that is just going to alienate that group so much more because I am a person that does have medical trauma. And if I have to pay for that medical trauma, quite frankly, I'm not interested in doing that. So I just wanted uh, that experience to be shared that there's so many patients that feel left behind as it is and we need to bring them up to speed, not to be moving forward into a new system that we're not even sure is going to work in the first place. So we need to make sure that no one's being left behind before we move forward into something we don't know that works. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Robin, I think she was, uh, she was accentuating your point, really, yes, that, like the, the immiseration of so many Canadians. In, the, in the, my province of Nova Scotia, they, uh, there was a cutoff for supporting people for transport to cancer care and also for ostomy supplies. The, uh, the income you had to have as a family was $12,000 a year to qualify for that program. <laughs> so there, if anybody made 13000 they and their whole family couldn't access those medical supplies or the money, the support programs that are in place. So these sort of means ends tested approaches are harming people who now find themselves with escalated rent, escalated uh, health issues. So uh, I'm very, very glad for this point, that question, the idea of uh, people feeling uh, frightened and left behind uh, around uh, because they just can't pay for this. They just can't. We have only have five minutes and so many more questions to get to. Hassan, really quickly. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, thank you so much for your comments. And I think they're so important because Canadians are facing a cost of living crisis. And the idea of introducing private pay into that time, I think is actually quite cruel. And then the other point I'll make is just uh, like, think about the perverse incentives that, that we have in our system for, for people, right? Uh, being forced to stay on ODSP in some cases, because if you, got employed, you lose your, your access to essential medications. Or in the other practice I have in addiction medicine, I have patients who can't start on treatment because they don't have medication coverage and fentanyl is cheaper than something like buprenorphine, right? Those are the incentives of the system right now. And you know, we're not getting the outcomes we need because we're, we're creating all the wrong incentives. Yeah, here's a question. It's kind of a rhetorical question from David Price. Government managed healthcare is failing Canadians and providers. Why do we continue to expect politicians to manage healthcare delivery when it is an impossible dream for them to put patient and provider safety above political safety? Uh, this is Shannon McDonald. How does the inclusion of, how, how does the inclusion of private access to care impact Indigenous people, new Canadians, and others who cannot afford the costs. With limited HR resources in the system overall, how will the public system continue to provide care even at the level we struggle to support now? 
How will care in rural communities be sustained? Eric, do you want to take that quickly? Sorry, the gist of it was rural communities? Yeah, it's, it says, um, how will care in rural communities be sustained? Well, it's, it's, it's a real challenge, obviously. Uh, you know, you need a certain critical mass sometimes to deliver a certain service. I think technology can help us a lot, remote patient uh, monitoring, virtual care. Uh, we have to be cognizant, though, that there are many uh, people in rural Canada that don't have access or the privilege to own those types of devices or the ability to manage them, so we have to be able to, to do that. And I think, you know, if you look at... I'll, I'll pick Nova Scotia as an example. They, they do some wonderful things in the health system there. One of them is, you know, uh, asking um, paramedics, for example, to provide mobile integrated health or community paramedicine uh, in those smaller communities. So sometimes in Long and Briar Island, you know, the, the primary care there can be done by uh, advanced care paramedics. And not just paramedics, but, you know, often we can bring in nurses and other uh, types of clinicians into the rural services. And if they, they through technology, which they can manage, can access um, clinicians, uh, you know, physicians and specialists, you know, they can bring the care to those homes and to those smaller communities. Okay. Let's take a question from the audience. Yes, back here. Hi, I'm Terry Meehan. I'm a long-term activist and a pa patient advocate. Uh, um, I'm very skeptical, oh, sorry, skeptical about um, uh, uh, being able to pay for um, line jumping. Uh, I, uh, although I do uh, uh, like the idea of, uh, or excuse me, sorry, just having a moment, um, of uh, publicly funded private care, um, that's been around for years, and I think some research should go into what works. Uh, I, I would suggest researchers look at the Shoulders Clinic as an as as awesome example of a private clinic that's publicly funded. I'm just a little tired uh, of this whole like let's do the same thing all over and and, and it doesn't work so we so we don't um, we don't do it anymore. There's like all kinds of things that have worked and I think a lot more research should go into looking what works. I know there's a lot of researchers um, in the medical community. I'll uh, put some of the young researchers into what has worked and what tweaks do we need. Not kill the whole system, start over like we seem to be doing, but but just tweak and see what works now okay. with, with the technology that's now available. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Can we, can we get to another question? Yes, another question? Right back here, on the, on, to my right, I think. At the back? Yeah, it's, it's over here. Over there, I'm sorry. Yeah, my name yeah. is Emmanuel Gia, I'm from Alberta. I'm a family physician. Uh, we're talking about blind spots, and one of the things I've not heard us talk about is the big place called the U.S. south of us. I'm all for ring fencing and protecting some services which are absolutely necessary in the public system and publicly paid. But we all know that Canadians are going south and getting elective procedures south. Isn't it time we kept that money here in Canada so that it at least helps to continue to propel our economy? Thank you. Hassan, did you want to address that? I mean, I think ultimately this comes down to the fact that we have a finite set of resources, right? I, I mean, what determines how quickly people can access care is we have a limited number of doctors, nurses, hospital beds, operating room time. And I think the question is, how do we distribute that uh, equitably and efficiently? And so if we allow people to pay to get to the front of the line, we just rearrange the line. Um, so I, I think that it's just kind of a, a simple mathematical issue, actually. Here's a question from uh, Greg Nolan, Michael Nolan. Uh, Michael says, why should we be paying agencies and not-for-profit and for-profit companies extraordinary management rates with tax dollars to underpay their workers to provide a public health service? Who benefits from this approach? The paid board of directors? Executives? Shareholders? Is there another question? I'll take one more question from the audience. Yes. Okay. Hi, my life is. Hi, my name is uh, Claire. Um, I'm from Vancouver. I'm South African by birth. I'm a patient. I'm South African by birth. I have lived in Australia. I now live in Vancouver. Um, so I have accessed care in many different countries. So I have accessed private care, I've accessed public care. Um, I also access care in the U.S. currently as well. 
Um, I have had my life saved twice by being able to access private care living in BC when I've fallen through the cracks. So yes, I have been privileged enough to be able to pay for that private MRI that showed that I had hydrocephalus um, when it was not picked up. And I have been able to pay for surgery to be able to save my life for that. I am passionate about the public system, which allows me to be able to walk through that door and not have to pay for it. But I'm also putting aside money each and every day to be able to ensure that I have the choice and the option to be able to make that choice as a patient because currently I don't have enough confidence to be able to have access to care when I need it. And I would really like to say, let's fall in love with the problem. And I see that more and more every day and not just the solutions, because I think that's really critical. And let's leave the door open for conversation, an open and honest conversation. And I truly love the Canadian healthcare system because it offers a lot more than the countries that I have lived in. But I think choice is really one of the things that I think we need to offer. And really access to care is a struggle for so many patients, including myself. And so I just wanna say the open and honest conversation and let's look for those better questions and let's allow that from citizens and not just patients and families and caregivers, but those who are going to be patients one day. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's gonna to have to be the final comment and question, but Robin, I'd, ask, I'd like to ask you to address what, what the, the speaker just said. Well, I just, uh, you know, Claire, so I'm just doing, affirming that, uh, that uh, people with lived experience, if you will find people who've had uh, all Canadian experience, a patchwork of American and Canadian and all American, and you can hear, and uh, other foreign, other countries, Sweden and all the rest. And uh, so in the, those dialogues, you'll be hearing about what are, uh, what are efficiencies that could be capitalized on in other places? Uh, what are things that uh, healthcare costs that could be prevented if they're uh, infused at an earlier point in the in the in the pathway? All kinds of things. So the more to, the more voices and the more experience, including lived experience, the better. Yeah, Eric, your final final comments. Yeah, I think this is such an important uh, debate. I'm, I'm really uh, emboldened by by the. Uh, the discussion today. I think that people want pragmatic solutions. Um, I think we've surfaced that you know the system is funded well enough. We just have to find a way collaboratively to put the money where it's most needed to solve the, the most pressing problems. And I think that part of that collaboration is involving all stakeholders, starting with with patients and family caregivers. But there should be room at the table for private organizations that can bring new ideas forward and um, you know, can take uh, some responsibility for delivering a system that will improve things for all of us. Hassan, final word to you. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and I really appreciate the, the comment and the story. And I think it just goes to highlight how critical it is that we change the status quo, that it is not working for people. And I think that there's a big difference between the decisions that people make as an individual in a time of stress and, and the decisions we make about the system. And when we look at the CAMBI trial that just uh, you know, happened in British Columbia, the review of the evidence, the legal decisions kind of been made. It's looked at it and said, you know, when we allow private health care to flourish, the, the harms to people that can't access that is not worth the benefits to the people who can. And I think that we have a responsibility when we make a commitment to have a public system that that system has to work for people. And if it's not, we need to keep working at it and investing in it and being held accountable to it to make sure it does. Well, Hassan, Robin, Eric, thank you so much for your candor. Uh, thank you so much for your forthrightness. And thank you so much for your passion as well. You know, th this, is a, this was a very vigorous debate. Uh, and, and clearly, this is a debate that people are very much engaged in. We had lots and lots of questions, and I apologize to those people to whom I, could, we, I couldn't get to you. Uh, but clearly, this is a debate that has legs. It has legs. <laughs> and, and we will continue to, to discuss it, but hopefully uh, discuss it in a manner that will allow us to find solutions to some of the, the critical problems that, that face the system. So thank you so much. And thank you to our audience as well for your engagement.